Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today um, from Adversity to Resilience, Three Innovative Text Messaging Interventions in the SPIN Social Media Initiative. We're really happy to be with you today. Um, no one in our group has any disclosures. And this is what we're hoping you'll learn from this session, that you'll be able to describe our three text messaging interventions and how we engaged hard to reach populations, that you'll see the pluses and minuses of our text messaging examples and strategies, and that you'll recognize the importance of using text messaging to reach people living with HIV and improve care continuum outcomes. If you'd like to claim credit, here's how you do this, um, logging into the website. And acknowledgements to HRSA and to our funders and our specific grants. Um, we're always, we're very appreciative that we were able to do these interventions. And of course, uh, wanna thank our funders. So the first intervention we're gonna talk about is one called Evolution, uh, Connect, Engage, Thrive. This comes from Washington University and this is my team of colleagues. None of this work gets done without a team and I'm very grateful to have their support. Uh, this intervention was done within the context of Project ARC, um, which is situated in St. Louis, Missouri. And for this intervention, we targeted both our Washington University Part C and D programs, as well as our community-based uh, Ryan White program, Project ARC. Um, really together, we offer one-stop shop uh, in multidisciplinary services for, uh, yeah, for people impacted by HIV in the St. Louis region. A little background about our intervention. Um, I think most people in this audience know, uh, live and breathe every day that young people are disproportionately impacted by HIV. And in particular, uh, young people of color um, especially young people of color who identify as gay and bisexual. Um, and I think most people in this audience know the HIV care continuum. You're going to hear from all of us today how our interventions were especially focused on improving outcomes in the HIV care continuum. In particular for this intervention, Evolution, we were looking at to really engage people in care and achieve viral load suppression. Many of you in the audience know, live, and breathe the barriers to achieving viral load suppression every day. These were some of uh, the barriers that we identified in our program. Um, poverty, mental illness, housing instability, stigma, relationship changes, substance use, um, were all issues directly impacting the people we serve. And so we wanted to find out where these folks were. So how could we reach them in ways um, that were consistent with their lives? And when we uh, went looking for mobile health and text messaging interventions, it was clear to us that for young African-American teens, a smartphone um, and text messaging was a critical piece of that puzzle. So our eligibility criteria for the intervention we implemented and studied was for young people between the ages of 18 and to 29 who um, were HIV positive and received care in our Washington University clinics. Um, it could be at any of the clinical sites. They needed to have access to a private mobile device that had texting capabilities. And we really tried to target the intervention to those who were either new to care, were not linked to care, or were struggling with care continuum outcomes. Namely, they were not fully retained in care or they were not virally suppressed. This is who we recruited into our study and into our intervention. Um, and you can see that um, it really reflects what I just descri described to you in terms of HIV prevalence. So the majority uh, self-identified as black, male, um, an overwhelming uh, number, 71%, were living below 200% uh, of the federal poverty line. 
Uh, the vast majority acquired HIV from male-to-male -male sexual contact, um, and the average age uh, was close to 23. In addition, um, our young people involved in this intervention faced a lot of adversity. Um, so you can see high uh, rates of depression, intimate partner violence, substance use. Um, I find it, especially in light of um, the racial justice issues, appalling that nearly half had spent some time in jail or prison. And what we really tried to do in this intervention is shift the communication between participants and their case managers to the client's preferred method of communication, which for our group of clients was text messaging. It was a combination of automated and two-way text messaging. The automated um, reminders included medication reminders and appointment reminders. And then we also had some mood check-ins, housing, utility needs assistance. And when people triggered a response to these reminders that they were struggling or they had a need, those needs triggered alerts that um, would come to the case managers. And um, I'm gonna show you what this looks like. Um, so on the left is the patient cell phone and on the right is the care manager cell phone. So a pop-up would come and would say, did you take your medicine? The um, participant could choose the word medication or vitamin um, or any other word they wanted to use in that reminder. The participant also was able to choose the time of that reminder in a way that worked best for them. The reason you see the spacing between confidential message and the message is that if it popped up on someone's cell phone, it would only appear in the bar as confidential message. And then from there, uh, if the person replied no, um, they would get a second line of choices. Um, and if they, and they could answer any of these. Um, and then um, the system says, hey, thanks for letting us know. For the care manager, it shows that a patient missed their dose because they felt sick and it gives them a way to reach out to them directly or to go to the um, EHR and uh, further understand the details um, if there were any regarding the patient's answer. So we were able to uh, retain 89 out of 100 participants for um, at least six months and a number of alerts were triggered. Um, keep in mind under the medication tracking alerts were alerts for mood check-ins and social service needs. So, and um, I think what we see is that there were a lot of issues related to housing and bills, um, a lot of reasons for missed appointments related to work, transportation, and other reasons. And so we were able to work with participants on rescheduling when they couldn't make those appointments. And, um, and so in total, we had close to 400 uh, alerts triggered that then led to case managers uh, reaching out to clients and participants. Um, we also wanted to make sure um, in our evaluation that we had qualitative evaluation, both from participants and our case managers. And this was some of the participant feedback. Um, I think overwhelmingly people really, this first bullet is very important and that people really communicated that they felt somebody cared about them um, and that they really got the help when they asked for the help. Um, and uh, people participated, participated and appreciated the daily medication reminders. Um, and they really felt like their service was more timely. Um, our evaluation results also included quantitative evaluation results. And you can see here that we were able to demonstrate increased virologic suppression, uh, increased kept medical visits, and um, again, the report of improved communication with case managers. Um, and so what you can see here is um, really uh, the important target of uh, retention increasing by 14%. Um, you know, most of our prescribers were, were giving um, ART and then the increase in viral load suppression um, by 18%. In terms of our quantitative findings, 
um, a significantly greater proportion of virally suppressed participants at uh, six months and 12 months compared to baseline. Um, the community viral load was also lowered. Um, the intervention results were maintained over the 12 month period, um, but we cannot infer causation because uh, we did not have a control group for this study. Um, a number of reported uh, strengths of this intervention were from the case management side, really helpful in managing appointments in real time problem solving and exchanging resources and documentation. Our case managers also felt like it really streamlined their tasks and um, gave them greater accessibility to the client's participants. They also really felt like they were involved in a timely way when um, people reached out because there was a crisis. And in general, as I showed you from some of that early participant qualitative feedback, um, the participants really felt um, that the medication reminders and the check-in messages were very supportive to them managing um, their HIV. Um, a couple of lessons learned um, because, you know, nothing is perfect in any intervention and you'll hear that from all of us today. Um, so we definitely had to work on privacy. Um, that's why I pointed out to you some of that um, intentional um, pop-up build um, that we put into the intervention. I think also we, as part of our um, consent process, really walked people through uh, what would happen if somebody found your cell phone, what would that be like for you, just to make sure that people were thinking through their privacy before they engaged in the intervention. Um, uh, I think that it is not always possible to provide the emotional support that our case managers wanted to via text. Um, and sometimes people weren't able to take phone calls when case managers really thought the back and forth would be better done that way. Um, it's also really important to set boundaries. So, um, you know, we case managers are not expected to answer these anytime, day or night. Um, we did set that it was really for business hours and that um, you would get return messages within uh, 24 hours. And then um, people did have to change cell phones. Um, people often had multiple phone numbers. Um, and so keeping up with that was definitely, um, you know, part of the job of our intervention team. Um, some other things that we would do if we could uh, make adjustments to the design going forward, and hopefully we'll be able to do that, is that um, some of the messages were, didn't have a supportive tone. So, you know, we could have started out, uh, one participant, you know, I think says in this lovely uh, little bloom here, you know, maybe you could have started out with good morning, as opposed to just saying, did you take your medicine today? So I think um, some of that warmer, more relatable feel was important. Um, and then, you know, it was very important for us to set up and establish protocols so case managers felt confident in what was um, needed from them and that clients knew what to expect. Um, also, just, you know, as I talked about uh, the constant changes with cell phones and phone numbers and just knowing clients' plans and um, where they could be reached and how to use their service um, to really decrease um, the costs for them and maximize the service for them. Um, and then I think just establishing regular check-ins with them about, you know, are there any changes in your phone service when they come in from a, an appointment just to make sure, um, just like we check other demographic information that we keep tabs on that too. Um, so um, I, I think many of us feel this every day in our relationships with young people and the importance of text messaging. And I think this intervention really showed that text messaging is uh, where young people wanna be and it's a way for us to reach them. Um, I think cell phones can definitely be our friends, um, that text messaging can help young people manage a chronic illness. We can intervene on the social determinants of health over text messaging. Um, we also showed that text messaging can help reduce those disparities that we sometimes see in the HIV care continuum. And um, we're currently in the process of advocating for our intervention to go statewide in Missouri. 
And so I leave you with a couple of inspirational quotations. I know everybody's really working hard um, in this day and age to help uh, people with HIV succeed and achieve viral load suppression. And I'm gonna turn it over uh, next uh, to uh, my colleague, uh, Jesse Fletcher. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening as the case may be. Um, my name is Jesse Fletcher. I'm a research scientist at Friends Research Institute. And along with Dr. Kathy Reback and Dr. Kimberly Kissler, I have the honor and the pleasure of talking about the Text Me Girl intervention, which um, like the evolution intervention is a text messaging intervention, but our target population is young adult transgender women living with HIV. And again, we were once again trying to advance uh, this population through the HIV care continuum using text messages. Next slide, please. Here you can see some of the um, promotional imagery that was developed for the Text Me Girl intervention. Um, Friends Research Institute runs the Los Angeles site Friends Community Center. Um, and we're not a clinic, um, as Dr. Platz's site is. Um, we're a community center, and so we have to do a lot of outreach to get people interested in the programs that we're doing. And this is some of the imagery that we used. Clearly, we were aiming at a younger population of trans women, and uh, we were focusing heavily on the uh, technology and text messaging aspect. Next slide, please. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, um, transgender women or trans women in the United States are orders of magnitude more likely to be infected with HIV than other adult populations. Um, Partially, as a due to, partially due to a number of syndemic, uh, systemic, and reinforcing uh, structural health disparities and psychosocial uh, health risks, trans women face, um, uh, including homelessness, uh, substance use disorders, um, cycles of incarceration, victimization, and violence. Um, they have been noted to engage in um, statistically increased rates of HIV sexual risk behaviors. Uh, including sex work, which uh, is often comes part and parcel with engagement in condomless uh, intercourse behaviors and sex while intoxicated or high. After infection, um, trans women uh, in the United States are statistically less likely to receive ART medications, to be ART adherent, or to in fact reach full viral suppression than their cisgender counterparts. Um, it's also the case in the United States that almost any health disparity that you can name that is affecting trans women at a higher rate than cisgender persons is even more pronounced among uh, racial and ethnic minority trans women, trans women of color uh, and younger trans women. And um, the intersectionality of youth or race uh, or uh, having a different cultural ethnic background with these um, problems tends to exacerbate them in the United States. Next slide, please. So for this study, um, what we did is we, we enrolled um, individuals who identified on the feminine spectrum, uh, any sort of trans feminine identity as a woman or a trans woman or anything, uh, but you had to have been assigned male sex at, at birth. Um, you had to be under the age of 35, HIV positive. We verified this either through lab reports um, or through testing them ourselves if necessary. And you had to be uh, willing and able to receive text messages or uh, emails on a daily basis, including if you went with the text message route, having a reliable access to a cell phone and having unlimited uh, messaging plans. We, we found uh, that that was essentially ubiquitous amongst this population, so that that didn't end up being a problem. Uh, we did incentivize people, uh, but only for assessments. So uh, we assessed them at baseline three months, six months, 12 months, and 18 months. And every time they came in for one of the assessments, we did incentivize them, but they were not contingently incentivized for any participation in the intervention itself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the major benefits of uh, digital interventions, like text messaging interventions, is the ability to target them, to tailor them, and to personalize them specifically for the populations that you're looking to work with. So in this instance, the Text Me Girl intervention was targeted specifically at the young trans women in Los Angeles County who are living with HIV and having trouble uh, advancing through the HIV care continuum. 
The content itself was tailored by and for this community. This includes using culturally appropriate, nuanced and responsive language, um, using phrases and terms that they would identify with and see as part of uh, their internal community, focusing the content on the areas that we thought were particularly important to address the needs that they have, um, and even when and how they wanted to receive these messages so it fit into their sleeping schedule and working schedule as necessary. And finally, there was a personalization ability where as people were enrolled, we could sign them up for the specific hours that they wanted, uh, their name could be added to introduction messages, things like that, so that they felt they were getting the messages uh, specifically on the schedule and in the way that they, that they wanted. Next. Slide, please. <laughs> um, in the end, there were 270 uh, scripted theory-based text messages created for the Text Me Girl intervention. Um, and the, the thing to understand about the structure of these messages is that they are simultaneously arrayed across three content areas uh, and three theoretical models uh, at, this, at the same time. So um, the three content areas were HIV positivity uh, and physical and emotional health. That's just getting these people to feel less stigmatized about their HIV status and to be more um, in tune with and responsive to their physical and emotional health needs. Linkage retention to HIV care, which expressed the importance and the benefits of engaging with HIV primary care. And finally, our adherence and viral load suppression, which expressed the importance and the benefits of engaging with uh, antiretrovirals. But at the same time, these three content areas were arrayed evenly across three theoretical models. First, social support theory, which is broadly the idea that if you provide supportive resources or emotional support or supportive information to people, they will be better able to uh, engage with the healthy behaviors that you're hoping they'll, they'll take on. Social cognitive theory, which is focused on increasing feelings of self-efficacy um, within people so that they feel that they can do something, they have the confidence to, to try to take it on, and that is predicted to improve their ability to engage with healthy behaviors. And then finally, the health belief model, the this is your brain on drugs version, where they try to um, inform people as to the potential risks of engaging in certain behaviors and the overwhelming benefits of engaging in different behaviors. So uh, we took all three content areas and all three, three medical, theoretical models and we made sure that they were evenly arrayed across all simultaneously, which leads to, next slide please, this breakdown of how the structure of the text message library for Text Be Girl uh, was built. You'll notice the three content areas are uh, along the columns along the top and the three theoretical foundations are in the rows along the side. And at each intersection within the body of the table, you'll notice that there are 30 messages per intersection. So for example, there's 30 messages that address HIV positivity and physical and emotional health in a supportive way. 30 which address um, it, that same topic area using social cognitive theory and 30 more messages which do it using the health belief model for 90 total messages about HIV positivity. And that same thing is repeated for linkage retention and care and art medication here inch, leading to 270 uh, messages total. Next slide, please. Uh, the way these messages were created um, relies entirely on community-based uh, participatory research. If, if we didn't have strong decades old connections to the transgender community in Los Angeles County, this would not have been possible. The messages were themselves um, written by uh, young adult trans staff working at Friends Research Institute. They were adapted originally from another text messaging library developed for methamphetamine using men who have sex with men, uh, the Project Tech Support Study, which was designed to decrease HIV risk behaviors in that population. Um, the young adult trans staff basically wiped out all of the cultural references and language, all the references to methamphetamine, and used just the, the skeleton of what was left to build in messages that had the new content areas and focus still on the three uh, theoretical messages. Once that revised library for Text Me Girl was created, it was brought repeatedly before a transgender community advisory board that was focused on uh, youth and health issues. And the messages were brought to them, they edited them, they talked through them, they sent it back to the trans staff who edited them, sent it back. This went back and forth through iterations until finally when all of the stakeholders were satisfied with it. It was sent back to the research team for slight modifications to make sure it all fit within that table that we showed you before. 
uh, and that every behavioral theory was fully saturated and every content area was fully saturated and ready for delivery. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of the kinds of messages that were created through this iterative uh, process. And as you can see, they've been arrayed across each of the content areas and theoretical mechanisms uh, for you. So for example, if you take the uh, very top message, it would be a social support message expressing HIV positivity. And you'd have trans women living positive, loving life. So just something about being positive about who you are, about positive about your position in life, positive about being transgender, very supportive. And contrast that against the first message of the health belief model. So same content area, but now a health belief approach. It says one night of fun, a lifetime with herpes, right? A, a kind of dark reminder, far less supportive of the uh, lifelong nature of uh, viral infection. And finally, let's say the top message of the social cognitive theory, make no compromise, you can protect yourself, girl. And that's again, that you can do this kind of um, self-efficacy improvements that you're looking for in, self, in social cognitive theory. Next slide, please. So the entire uh, process was automated. Text Me Girl is not a bi-directional texting intervention. We did not send and receive messages. We only sent messages through an automated system. They were delivered either through phone or email. Most, about six and 10, chose uh, over the text messages over the phone. Um, and they were sent three times a day. They could personalize when these times were, but if they didn't have an opinion on it, it was sent to noon at 5 p.m. and at 10 p.m., so a 10-hour uh, period, sent to three. And the intervention lasted 90 days, and the 270 messages were sent out evenly over the 90 days, so three times a day for 90 days, and the same message was never sent more than once. So they only saw each one once. It was like a, a full script of unique content over the 270 days. Next slide, please. Here's how the sociodemographics of the Text Me Girl participants broke down. We enrolled from December 2016 through May 2018. Most participants um, were between the ages of 30 and 34, with the skewed older than we were expecting, but this was the community that uh, presented themselves to us when we opened enrollment. Um, about 80% of participants identified as either Hispanic, Latinx, or African American Black. Uh, only 10% identified as Caucasian and white. 40% um, had not graduated from high school, showing um, fairly extreme um, obstacles to educational attainment in this population. The median income was about $500 um, a month, which uh, for Los Angeles County is extraordinarily low. Uh, it's very hard to live off of that in Los Angeles County. And about 43%, 44% uh, were currently homeless or uh, experiencing some other form of housing instability. Next slide, please. Risk behaviors were also relatively prominent at baseline. 21% um, of the sample was uh, engaged in methamphetamine use. They were averaging more than 11 sexual partners in the previous six months with a standard deviation of 32. Um, that's a reflection, that standard deviation of the fact that 25% of the sample was currently engaged and 23% was currently engaged in sex work. Uh, at baseline and significant minorities between 10 to 15% were engaged in serodiscordant condomless annual intercourse at baseline. Next slide, please. Uh, as Dr. Plax mentioned, uh, each one of these uh, interventions was designed to address movement through the HIV care continuum. This was where our folks were at at baseline. All of them had been diagnosed with HIV, but only about three quarters had been linked into care. About half had uh, been a prescribed art. We're, we're not a clinic, so we're seeing people right off the street, so our art uptake is significantly lower. And only about a third were currently virally suppressed. And only uh, one in 20, about 5% of the, of the sample, the participants, uh, believed that their uh, medication adherence, their art medication adherence, was currently excellent. Next slide, please. This is how those same HIV care continuing outcomes changed over the course of the Text Me Girl intervention. As you can see, uh, retention in HIV care did not change over the course of the intervention. It started at 62% of the sample at baseline and ended at 62% at 18 month follow up. But when looking at ART medication uptake, though we started at 50% of the sample, by the time uh, we got to 18 month follow up, it was more than three quarters of the sample was um, currently on ART. When we look at ART medication adherence, while only 5% were uh, excellent, 
in the excellent category of adherence at baseline, 38% were in the excellent category by 18 month follow-up. And only about a third of the sample was undetectable at baseline. This had risen to more than half the sample at 18 month follow-up. Um, I have also, um, in the interim between writing this presentation and in this moment here, the primary outcome analyses have been carried out. Um, these effects are not only durable through 18 month follow-up, they're durable across sociodemographic controls. And though the results presented here were self-reported undetectable viral load, in the primary outcomes, we were able to analyze the clinical results and we also saw significant improvements in undetectable viral load through 18 month follow-up in the clinical viral load data. Next slide, please. We believe these results are extremely promising. Um, at baseline, the participants of the Texas Me Girl study were heavily impacted. Um, they were in high-risk demographic categories, 80% um, Latinx or African-American Black, uh, all young. They showed uh, extreme um, obstacles to educational attainment, extreme poverty for the Los Angeles County area. Um, more than 40% were either homeless or experiencing housing instability, and yet, even in this extremely impacted group, uh, the Text Me Girl intervention was able to improve all of the gold standard markers for advancement of the HIV care continuum, um, including art uptake, art adherence, and advancement through full viral suppression, and that these findings were durable all the way through the 18 month follow up. Um, it's important to note that the Text Me Girl intervention is automated, uh, unidirectional, and uh, very segmentable. So it's a sad reality that any intervention that hopes to intervene in the HIV outcomes of highly impacted young transgender women is probably going to have to be able to be applied in extremely resource limited settings. Um, this isn't an area where there's a lot of uh, money being pumped into these communities at this point. And Text Me Girl with its high scalability, high replicability, extremely low cost, is um, ideal perhaps uh, as a mechanism for intervening in this population as it does not require any sort of app to download, any sort of data plan on your phone. It's entirely text-based and doesn't require any staff time to carry out. Uh, we're very proud of the results of Text Me Girl. We're excited about them and we believe that the future of intervening in these difficult to reach, highly vulnerable, highly impacted populations is going to be these kinds of um, digital M health, possibly text-based uh, interventions. Next slide, please. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I would ask uh, that you uh, direct them to the principal investigator of this study, um, Dr. Kathy J. Reback, who was supposed to give this presentation today, but couldn't be here for uh, family reasons. And um, we'd be very happy to get, to get back to you. And we thank everyone in the SPINs social media initiative for giving us the chance to participate in this great uh, thing. Thank you so much. All right. Hello. Um, my name is Lily Mann Jackson and I'm a senior research associate at Wake Forest School of Medicine. And I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Scott Rhodes, who was unable to present today due to a family emergency. I'm also presenting on behalf of the entire We Care team, which is a partnership between Wake Forest School of Medicine and University of North Carolina Greensboro. And today I'm gonna to be talking about our intervention, which harnesses social media messaging, including text messaging, um, to improve care engagement among young gay, bisexual, and other men of sex with men, and transgender women living with HIV. Next slide, please. So there's an urgent need to address the disproportionate burden of HIV here in the South, which has been referred to as the new and latest US HIV epicenter. There's also a need to address HIV related disparities faced by particular population subgroups, particularly young and racial or ethnic minority, gay, bisexual, and other men of sex of men and transgender women who have higher rates of HIV and are less likely to be engaged in HIV care or to be virally suppressed. Next slide, please. So for these reasons, uh, our team developed the We Care Intervention as part of the HRSA SPIN social media initiative. We Care is an innovative and bilingual intervention in English and Spanish that is designed to increase HIV care linkage and reduce missed appointments and viral load among young, racially and ethnically diverse, gay and bisexual and other men of sex with men and transgender women who are often 
underserved, underinsured, and considered hard to reach uh, by researchers and practitioners. Um, we Care is implemented by cyber health educators who work with participants for 12 months using established social media platforms that are commonly used by members of these communities, um, including Facebook Messenger, um, text messaging, um, and the messaging features of GPS-based mobile apps that are used for social and sexual networking, such as Adam for Adam Radar, Badoo, Grinder, Jacked, and Scruff. And so rather than developing and introducing participants and encouraging them to use a new app, um, we really focus on harnessing social media um, that participants were already familiar with and using on a regular basis. And participants were able to choose which of these platforms the cyber health educators use to interact with them. Next slide, please. So this intervention is really grounded in health behavior theory. Um, the table shows how the types of social me media messages that were sent by our cyber health educators map onto different constructs of the social cognitive theory and empowerment theory, and also onto different stages of the HIV care continuum. These theory-based messages were developed using um, a community-based participatory research approach in partnership with a steering committee that was comprised primarily of young gay and bisexual and other men of sex with men and transgender women living with HIV. And when implementing the intervention, the cyber health educators adapted these sample messages for each participant on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and this messaging table um, can be found in the publication that's highlighted here on the screen um, in AIDS patient care and STDs. Next slide, please. So this is a map showing our primary catchment area uh, for our HIV clinic here in North Carolina. We also see patients from outside this area, including in the city of High Point, which is in Guilford County, and a 30 county area of largely rural, central and western North Carolina and southern Virginia. Next slide, please. So to give you a sense of how rural our context is, um, this is a photo that was taken by my colleague Jorge Alonzo. Um, our team collects data out in the field and really meets participants where they are. And he took this photo on his way to conduct a follow-up assessment, driving down a dirt road to get to a participant's home in a very remote area over an hour from our HIV clinic. So um, there are really a lot of layers of access barriers that our participants face, um, including distance and transportation. Next slide, please. So participants in our intervention study were between the ages of 16 and 34. They self-identified as male or transgender, reported having sex with men, were living with HIV, and were either newly diagnosed within the past 12 months, not linked to care, out of care for at least six months, or not virally suppressed. So individuals that really would benefit from an HIV care engagement intervention. Next slide, please. So uh, we recruited 198 participants in total for our intervention study. We had a mean age of 26. Participants were randomized to either receive the We Care intervention or usual care. And um, nearly 70% of our participants identified as Black or African American, around 13% as Hispanic or Latinx. The majority identified as cisgender male, around 5% identified as transgender female, 75% identified as gay, um, and around 20% as bisexual. And we collected medical chart data and self-reported assessment data using a CASI at baseline and at six, 12, and 18 month follow-ups. And we were able to achieve retention rates on the ACASI assessments of 91% at six months, 83% at 12 months, and 85% at 18 months. And this was really thanks to the tireless efforts and creative strategies of our team members, um, particularly Jorge, who took the photo that was on the previous slide. Um, next slide, please. So our cyber health educators logged their interactions with participants using REDCap so that we could explore the types of uh, conversations that they had. Um, these included regular check-ins with participants, appointment reminders, um, following up in real time when participants did not make it to an appointment, uh, reminders to pick up prescriptions or checking in about adherence, helping participants problem solve barriers to care, um, providing other types of information or support, such as referrals for other services, 
Um, and then other types of messages just to sort of build social support, such as greetings on holidays or birthdays, celebrating milestones in participants' lives, such as a new job or finishing school. And all of these messages are personalized to the individual participant. And you can see some example screenshots of messages here. Um, for example, an appointment reminder that was sent on the text messaging app Kick. And as you can see in this case, the participant had actually thought that their appointment was scheduled for a different day. Um, and uh, this message definitely helped the participant get to an appointment that they might otherwise not have made it to. Um, the other screenshot, I think, really exemplifies why we're doing this work. Um, it's a text message from a participant who reached out to the cyber health educator to let him know that they had just learned that their viral load was undetectable. And so I think this tells us both that the participants' health outcomes have improved and also that the cyber health educator is an important and supportive person in that participant's life that they want to share this news with. Um, next slide, please. So finally, here is an example of a graduation message that the cyber health educator sent to participants when they had completed 12 months of participating in the intervention. And as you can see, um, this was a participant who really felt that they had benefited from the intervention, that the relationship they had built with the cyber health educator had been really beneficial, and they didn't want to leave the intervention. Next slide, please. Um, so we are still analyzing our data, but preliminary findings about intervention impact have been promising, um, both in terms of reduced missed appointments and viral suppression. Um, and We Care has been published in the CDC Compendium of Evidence-Based Interventions and Best Practices for HIV Prevention as an evidence-informed intervention for retention in HIV care and viral suppression. As I said, these are preliminary analyses and our analyses are still ongoing, so stay tuned for more outcome data in the future. Next slide, please. For our process evaluation, um, we had a qualitative component that was comprised of in-depth interviews with intervention participants, including those whose viral load was reduced, which we called stories of success, and those whose viral load was not reduced, which we called stories for learning. And we also conducted interviews with providers at our HIV clinic and clinic staff, such as nurses, social workers, and patient navigators, and our cyber health educators to get their perspectives on the WeCare intervention. Um, and we learned some important lessons from this qualitative data, including about the value of um, social media communication and messaging over more traditional communication methods, um, especially given that clinic providers and staff are somewhat limited in the ways that they can contact patients besides through phone calls, but social media use and texting, um, as we heard earlier in this session, are much more common among young gay and bisexual and other men of sex with men and transgender women than uh, phone calls. Um, this type of messaging is also more immediate. Um, cyber health educators can really intervene in the moment when a participant is not showing up for an appointment and show that somebody cares. And um, social media access may be more constant than phone, um, which may get disconnected or change, as you can see in the quote on this slide. Um, also, participants are able to refer back to a message that they received, uh, whereas it can be hard to remember everything that's shared in a phone conversation. We also learned about the importance of cyber health educators reflecting participant demographics, be it age, sexual orientation, gender identity, language, race, ethnicity, um, in order for participants to be able to connect with them. And we learned about the importance of implementing WeCare within a supportive clinic infrastructure with buy-in from clinic providers and staff. Um, you can see on this slide a very positive quote from a clinic staff member who felt that WeCare was a, a helpful addition to their clinic to be able to serve patients more comprehensively. And we also learned about the importance in our intervention of messages being bi-directional and not automated. Um, it was important for participants to know that the cyber health educators were real people on the other end of the phone. As one participant said, um, a computer is not a person that cares, a cyber health educator is a person that cares. Next slide, please. Other lessons included the importance of the cyber health educator building a personal relationship with each participant and basing um, interactions and messages based on that personal relationship so that cyber health educators were really viewed as a friend in the clinic. Um, participants found that relationship to be very important, especially when facing personal challenges. Uh, as one participant said, I don't know if he knew, but some days he texted me, I was going through some things. 
So just having that person to text and check up was real big. It was real helpful. Participants also emphasized that it was important to first meet the cyber health educator in person. Our cyber health educator was present in the HIV clinic and interacted with participants face to face at enrollment, um, which made a big difference in terms of developing trust. As one participant said, um, from a human standpoint, it is so great for you to really connect with somebody face to face instead of somebody you've never seen before or don't know because you're like, who the heck is this person and why are you asking me these questions, you know? So it's great that I actually get to put a face to the messages. And then finally, um, we learned how cyber health educators identified each participant's unique needs and priorities based on where they were on the HIV care continuum and then personalized messages to those needs and priorities. Next slide, please. So our qualitative findings also included some potential uh, future directions, uh, including potential adaptations to the intervention in terms of further tailoring the frequency of social media communication to participants' needs to find the right amount and frequency of social media communication um, to find, in order to keep them engaged. Um, also offering potentially additional support to help participants get to non-HIV related appointments that are also important for their health and their quality of life. And ensuring that content appeals to non-gay identifying participants and tailoring messages to their needs as well. Um, we also uh, identified some ways to potentially expand the intervention to other platforms. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback from participants about adding direct messaging through Instagram as a platform for intervention in the future. And um, potentially introducing an anonymous interactive peer-to-peer -peer social component. Um, we Care included an optional secret Facebook group. And while participants saw this group as a source of information and some gained a sense of so social support just from knowing that others like them were part of the group, um, many chose not to be part of the group or join the group but were reluctant to actively engage and indicated that they would prefer a more anonymous format that allowed for the use of aliases such as uh, the group me app um, so um, those are some things we're exploring for the future um, and then these qualitative findings are in a forthcoming paper that is part of a special focus issue of health promotion practice with the other sites in this spins initiative next slide please so um, that concludes my presentation. We are excited about the potential um, of this intervention and really appreciate you listening. Um, this is a photo of several members of our team at the final meeting for our SPINS initiative last summer, as well as our contact information. And again, thank you so much for your attention and time.